God could break through any barrier, and I'm excited to see what he's going to do. This morning, we are in our series, where it's called The Movement, and we're talking through the book of Acts and, and the movement that we see in the book of Acts. And today, I'm going to talk about Acts chapter 10, but before I do, I need to fill us in on where we've been. I don't want to just jump in here because we have to see what God's been doing. And so in Acts chapter 1, I'm going to give us just a quick recap. You have the apostles who are waiting in Jerusalem because Jesus says to wait on a gift. They're like, oh, we don't know what we're waiting for, but we'll wait. And so they wait. And then in Acts chapter 2, that gift was the Holy Spirit. And they're all filled with this spirit. And, and they come alive and there's joy and peace. And, and all of a sudden, they're, they're speaking in all these languages. And people are like, what is going on? Are they drunk? And they weren't drunk. They were just filled with this power, this spirit. Peter gets up and he boldly proclaims this message. And, and a ton of people are saved. And the Bible says that uh, thousands are, are added to their numbers. People are being added daily. They're devoted to the teachings and to fellowship and to prayer. And it says this. This is an amazing part of this chapter that none of them were with need. Like, no, none of them had need. I mean, imagine that you're, you're with a community and there's, there's no need whatsoever. You're seeing healings and you're seeing miracles and all of these things happening. And then you have this guy, Stephen, who also encounters this gospel and he's radically changed and he's proclaiming the gospel and, and they don't like it. And so Stephen, he gets stoned, stoned to death. And you would think that this is a moment in the story where the movement's about to stop, but much to their surprise, the movement doesn't stop. In fact, what happens is they all scatter. And when they scatter, the movement just keeps on going. The movement goes out further. Then you have another guy, Saul, who's trying to also stop this movement from happening. And Saul is on his way. He wants to persecute Christians. And on his way to do so, he encounters God. And then you have this, this story where, where he has this radical encounter with God. And Saul, who becomes Paul, he helps take a part of this movement. And it it doesn't pause the movement, rather it propels it. Because what we've been learning all throughout this series is if it's God, you can't stop it. If it's God, you cannot stop it. And this is what we're going to pick up in Acts chapter 10. But before we do, I'm not going to read the whole chapter. So I need to give us a little bit of an overview of what's happening in Acts chapter 10. It starts off with this centurion. His name is Cornelius. And Cornelius, it says, he's a God-fearing man. And he's, he's praying to God. And while he's praying, the Lord hears his prayers and sends an angel I don't know if any of you have seen an angel, but I, I haven't. And uh, he, he's terrified, and he's like, don't, don't be scared. It's okay. Uh, but he sends this angel to him to tell him to go get Peter, Peter from Joppa. Now, I'm going to explain why this is a big deal in a little bit, but he says, hey, I need you to go get Peter. Now, God is really cool because a few hours later when Peter is praying, God shows up to Peter. And gives Peter this crazy vision. And, and I remember reading the Bible and being really confused about what's happening. And I'm going to try to help break this down some. But essentially there's this vision, this sheet, it falls from heaven. And, and Peter, he's seeing these four-legged animals, reptiles and birds. And, and God says this, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Seems, seems really weird, a really weird thing that he says. And, and Peter says, surely not, Lord, I, I won't do this. And, and it happens three times, this, this same thing it happens with Peter. And then someone comes knocking at Peter's door. Because rem remember, Cornelius, he, he sent three men to go to Peter's house. And someone's knocking at Peter's door. And the spirit tells Peter, go answer that door and let them in. Now, this was a big deal because the people that were at Peter's door, they were, they were Gentiles and Peter was a Jew. And we're going to break down a little bit of why that was such a big deal. But if you can, just go and stand to your feet because we're going to finish reading this scripture. We are going to Acts chapter 10. And I'm going to pick us up in verse 22 if you're following along. Uh, we'll also have it up on the screens. But starting in verse 22, it says... The men replied, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. He's a righteous and God-fearing man who's respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him uh, to have you come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guest. The next day, Peter started out with them. So now Peter's going to their house. That's why he came to get them. And the following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting, and he had called all his relatives and close friends. So Cornelius knows Peter's going to come, and he grabs all of his friends. Come on. I, I have Peter. He, he's about to come. So he gets all of his friends together. So as Peter enters the house, Cornelius met him and fet, uh, fell at his feet in reverence. 
But Peter made him get up. He said, stand up. I'm only a man myself. And talking with him, Peter went inside and he found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you're well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objections. May I ask why you sent me? <laughs> he still doesn't know. So he's like, so why have you sent me? God told me to. So may I ask? And Cornelius tells him, well, four days ago, I was in my house praying. And at this hour, three in the afternoon, a man comes shining clothes and stands before me and says, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gift to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the house of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now that we're all here in the presence of God, to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Peter, who doesn't know he's going there, now says, okay, you're here. What do you have to tell us? Crazy, crazy story. So Peter then begins to speak, and it says this. I now realize how true it is. God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. Peter presents the gospel to them. We'll skip down to verse 44. It says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. Father, we ask that you would help us. Help us to receive anything you have for us this morning. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. And you can have a seat. So I'm going to start off with telling you a little secret. I did just say that I am the youth pastor, but a secret is when I started youth, I hated it. I hated working with teenagers, middle schoolers, high schoolers. Now, here's the reason why, though. I remember one of my friends, she was serving in youth at the time. I wasn't serving, and she asked me to come to the church with her to, to go pick up something. I don't remember what it was. We were at our old campus. I'm like, sure, like, I'll, I'll go to the church with you. And we walk into the auditorium, and they had just finished this retreat called Kairos. And there's this loud, like, rap music playing. There's kids running around like crazy. They're yelling. Like, they're super excited because they just had this amazing retreat. I don't know what's going on, but I'm just like, these kids are weird. <laughs> like, this is odd. Like, I don't, like, I, I can't really relate to, like, these teenagers. And, and I just, I, I kind of put up, like, I, I had some, some biases towards them. Let's say that. And so, fast track, uh, a year later, I do an internship program at our church. And we're put on different tracks. And my track's the youth track. <laughs> So I get to work with middle school and high school students, and, and I was excited to do it because I was like, well, I do need to grow in this. Like, I don't know how to reach teenagers. It seems very, very hard. And, uh, and so, so there, it was like a challenge, challenging side that made me, like, excited to do it. Uh, but I remember when I went in there, I was like, man... I, I just don't think I'm able to relate. I don't know if they, they could really know Jesus that well. Like, I don't know if they really go deep. Like, God, maybe, like, I'm called to, like, adults or, like, college students or, like, I, got, I don't know if teenagers is my thing. And the problem that I had is before I even started serving in this ministry, I was putting up barriers in my relationships, I was already creating these, these barriers, thinking of certain ways I needed to talk to them. And what happened was it was my biases that created barriers. I had this, this preconceived notion of who they were. I had all this, this, these different biases, and, and it created barriers in my relationships with them. Now, this isn't just the problem that I have. This is a problem we all have, which is our biases create barriers. We have certain biases in our life that place barriers in relationships. So what's the big deal with barriers? Well, the enemy knows that if he could get a barrier in the way, he could actually maybe stop the movement. Or in the series on the movement, a barrier is simply a fence or an obstacle of any sort that prevents movement. That's, that's, what, I mean, that's the, the definition of a barrier. It's anything that's going to prevent some type of movement. And we see that the spirit is moving all throughout this early church, but we also see that we have a real enemy who, who's trying to put in barriers, who's trying to, to stop the movement. And I remember even with me, I was, I was never able to move in my relationships with students because I had put up barriers. In fact, it took seven months until I enjoyed working in youth ministry. I started in August. I remember in March, I did this fast. So I was just, I was like, Lord, I don't even know what my next steps are. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And I, I was doing this fast. And 
And God was just revealing a lot of things in my heart. And things just started to break down and they, and they started to change. And I started to see students differently. And I'll never forget the moment. I'm standing. I'm in an apartment complex. We're in the street. And it's, it was something so casual. I'm playing Frisbee with some students. And in that moment, I was just like, man, I love these students. I love what I do. I, all of a sudden, relationships started to change. My, my mindset towards them started to change. And what happened is when the barriers broke, the movement happened. See, barriers broke and, and something was able to happen. That's what I want to talk to you guys about this morning. When we let God break barriers in us, we allow the movement of the gospel to go through us. If we let God break down these barriers that we have in us, he could actually use the gospel to go through us. See, barriers, they have a way of blocking blessings. And Peter, he had a barrier of bias, of bias that needed to be broken so that God could pour out his blessing on all, on all. So I want to talk about two barriers this morning and what happens when we have these. The first thing is barriers, they block us from recognizing Bears have a way of stopping us from recognizing. In verse 13, I think it is, verse 13 we have in here, Peter is, is praying, and, and when he has that vision, God says, get up, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter's first response is, surely not, Lord. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. And the voice spoke to him a second time, and he said, don't call anything impure that God has made clean. See, Peter's first response, though, because of his bias, is, no, no way, God. Sure, surely not, Lord. Like, I, I won't do that because, because why? Because he had a bias. Now, it's, I, I want to be clear. This was not an easy lesson for Peter to learn. I, I can't make light of how big this barrier were, well, was between the Jews and, and the Gentiles. Now, if you're, if you're anything like me, I remember uh, when I first started getting into reading Scripture, a lot of things were confusing. Like, for instance, what's a Gentile? I'm reading them like, I don't, I don't even know what this means. I don't get the big deal. Why this sheet? Why all these weird things? Why, why does this matter? And a Gentile is simply anyone that was not Jewish. A, a non-Jew was a Gentile. And, and there was this mutual uh, hatred between the two groups. It was common for Jewish people to actually pray prayers thanking God that they weren't a Gentile. Like, thank you, God, that I'm, not, that I'm not a Gentile. And then they would have certain regulations, oaths in place that would be like, I oath to never help out another Gentile. If they come up to me and ask for directions, I won't give them directions. It, it went as far as if there is a, a Gentile woman who is giving birth, we won't help her because, one, we're helping her, and two, you're bringing in another Gentile into the world. There was, there was this big barrier that they have. If, if a Jewish person would end up marrying a Gentile, they would have a funeral for the Jew because they considered them dead in their community. Like there were, there were these, these cultural like regulations that they had ended up creating and you definitely could never enter the house of a Gentile. See, in the same way, the Gentiles, they also despised the Jews. They thought they were this weird group that had a bunch of traditions and they assumed since they didn't eat pigs, they must have worshipped pigs and, and the Gentiles, they weren't really clear of what was going on with, with the Jewish people either. Can you imagine how hard it would be to let go of that type of teaching that had guided your nation for years, your culture for years. To be clear, when, when Jews showed this kind of bias, this is not the heart of God. This was not his intentions. Even in Deuteronomy, we see how God says, hey, he shows no partiality and he takes no bribe. And so, so through all of these biases, though, there were barriers that were being built and barriers, they block us from recognizing. And God, he's helping Peter to recognize this, this barrier through a vision. God is trying to destroy all of these racial barriers that are within Peter's heart. I love how God meets us where we are. It says in the story that, that he repeats this vision three times. If you, if you know Peter's story at all, there's this moment in scripture where, where Jesus tells Peter, you're going to deny me. And Peter's like, I won't deny you. No way. Sure enough, he doesn't just deny him. He denies him three times. And, and, and there's this, this moment where, where Peter had a bunch of guilt. And then we have this Jesus who comes to restore Peter. And he restores them by telling him three times, do you love me, Peter? Feed my sheep. Do you love me, Peter? Feed my sheep. It's as if God and Peter had this special language of three. 
And so it's just interesting to me that of all people, when God's speaking to Peter through this vision, he, he mentions it three times. And maybe, maybe he did this because he knew this would be a hard barrier to break. Maybe this is a way of, of God saying, trust me. This is, this is me speaking. And he says, what God has made clean, don't call common. See, in this vision, God shows Peter these ritually unclean animals that the Jews were, were taught to avoid. And a lot of people are like, well, are, is he changing the dieting laws? What's going on? The reality of the scripture that we need to understand is God's not trying to change Peter's diet here. God is trying to change Peter's heart. See, Peter needed this barrier broken to recognize God's heart for all people. Because when we let God break barriers in us, we allow the movement of the gospel to go through us. And today, we could still relate to this story. I, I, we have 100% made progress, but um, when it comes to today, I mean, it's like the most racially, politically, economically charged environment that I've, I've been a part of. And we have different perspectives based off of race and gender and ethnicity and nationality and education. And you could fill in the blank, whether it's your status or another array of factors. But a real question I want you to seriously ask the Spirit today who do I consciously or unconsciously treat as unclean? What barriers have kept me from recognizing the people God wants me to reach? And, and, and am I willing to let God break them? In verse 19, it says, while Peter was still thinking about this vision, the spirit says to him, hey, there's three men at, men at the door looking for you, so go downstairs, don't hesitate, because I've sent them. So Peter goes down and he says, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? I love this because Peter, he had to allow the spirit to break through his bias. Peter had to be willing to allow the spirit to come in and break through, right? Because he was about to go into a Gentile's house. And in verse 28, it says, he said to them, this is after he had gone to their house. You're well aware that it's against the law for a Jew to associate and visit a Gentile. He's making it very clear. You're, you're well aware that this isn't okay, but, but God has shown me that I shouldn't call anyone impure or unclean. Only God could remove the barriers, church. But God has shown me. See, I have to stop here and point out that, that barriers are broken in the but God moments. This is why prayer is so important. We need to hear God's voice on this. Because if it's me, if it's me that's praying and, and I'm talking, I, I know if it's me that's, that's conversating, it's like, but Brooke thinks this. And here's what I think about this situation. And here's how I think justice should be handled here. And this is what I think. And I need sometimes to God, for God to come in and say, Brooke, no, 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 no. But here's what I say. Because his word says his thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. But we do know his ways are good. And we do know he is perfect. And we do know he is loving. And we do know he is kind. And if you know this about your God, you have to know anything he speaks, it is good. And it is true. And it's what we need to hear. And I love how Peter, Peter allows him to come in. So Peter begins to speak in verse 34, and he says this, I now realize, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. See, when you recognize God loves all people, you love all people. And we need to reveal, we need God to reveal to us the beauty of people again, the value of people again. This is something that has been on my heart for months. I, I, I've been talk, I talked about it in youth a few weeks ago because I really, really, really believe we have lost sight of the value of people and it's destroying us. We've lost sight of the value of people, of pe and it's destroying us. Gossip is destroying us. Our gossip problem is a value problem. Porn is destroying us. Our porn problem is a value problem. It's valuing people. We have uh, bitterness that is destroying us. It's a value problem. We have disunity that is destroying us. It's a value problem. There are so many things that are, are destroying us, and it's because we've lost sight of value. And in Genesis, it says, we are all made in the image of God. We all bear his image. I mean, I want you to look around for a second. This is, I'm just, I, look, look around. Look at your neighbor. Look at that person to the left, to the right. Look around and think that is the image of God next to you. That's God's masterpiece. Like when's the last time you interacted with someone and you had that thought in your mind? You're God's masterpiece. 
We tell ourselves all the time to say this to ourselves, right? But when do you look at someone and you think, they're made in the image of God? It's called the Imago Dei. And I get it because sin has marred it and, and it's distorted it, but don't let the barriers of bias stop you from recognizing the image of God in other people. Because we're all valued. We're all wanted by God. There are no accidents. I need you to hear your value. Your value is from God. Your value is not from your followers. Your value is not from your weight. Your value is not from your job. Your value is not from your kids. Your value does not come from your marriage. Your value does not come from your marital status. Your value comes from God. You are valued from God. And we say amen to that. But can we also believe if our value comes from God, that means other people's do too. Their value is not in their job, and their value is not in their political party, and their value is not in the choices that they make, and their value isn't in, uh, in what they do or who they are or if they're married or if they have a lot of money or if they have no money. It's the same thing. And I think we hear in churches a lot that we have value, but I need us to hear that others have value. I need us to not just do an introspection but an outrospection where we're looking out, <laughs> which also means everyone's values from God. God has declared every human to have worth and dignity. And we put labels on things that God has already named. God says, do not call common <laughs> what I've made clean. Dude, we, we have called things differently than what God has called them. Right? And we think of value, and this is, this is what I was talking about with the youth a couple of weeks ago. We were talking about value, and I was like, what makes something valuable? Like, what, what makes it have value? A lot of times we're like, well, if it costs, like, a lot of money, or if it has, like, a lot of purpose, like, that makes it valuable. One of the most valuable things to us is this, right? At least to me. Like, I don't know if anyone, the reason why this is valuable is because this isn't just a phone to me, right? This is how I get around. This is my GPS this is the music I listen to. This is how I communicate. So what makes this particular thing valuable is not just how much it costs, because yes, it, it costs money, but, but more than that, it, it serves a purpose. I hope you can see where I'm going with this, because people, we're valuable. You know that everyone in here was created in the image of God for a purpose from God? That we actually all have a God-given purpose. Maybe you're here and say you didn't recognize that you have a God-given purpose, and so does your enemy. So does the person that sometimes really gets on your nerve. Like they have a God-given purpose. And when we know something is purposeful, we don't just go around and destroy it, right? Like when I know this serves a purpose, I'm careful with it. I don't just throw it in here like that. You know, like I don't, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't just you know, take a soda, for instance, and be like, you know what, actually, I don't really care about this phone, so I'm just gonna like, just kinda like destroy it some, and get rid of that. If anyone wants the rest of this Dr. Pepper, they could have it. And I'm like, I don't know if that's good enough, so I'm just gonna take another soda too, and just, I'm gonna sit here, and I'm just gonna drown this phone, and get rid of it. And some of you in here, anyone in here cringing at all, wondering? <laughs> Why, why is she destroying that phone? The problem we have is sometimes we care more about someone pouring Dr. Pepper on a phone than we do when someone comes up to you and they gossip about someone else. And we're destroying the image of God. And we don't even give it a second thought sometimes. But... But our phone, like, don't touch it. Uh, guys, I'm speaking from a place of where God has taken me, where God has told me, Brooke, do you value phones more than you value people? Of wondering, like, I don't, I don't know, God. Like, do I? Because we know what's valuable to us when, when, when that bothers us, right? Like when it's like, oh, she just poured. I was just at a water park the other day. I went to Aquatica for one of my friend's birthdays. And it's crazy to see how many people had the, the water phone or the water uh, proof case that they put their phone in. I think literally, like every person in the park had the necklace around their, ne their neck with their phone in it, protected. What do people do with phones? They guard them. They protect them. They put cases on them. They charge them. They take care of it. They make sure, oh, if I'm going to a water park, like I'm going to make sure it's covered. I'm going to make sure nothing happens. I'm going to make sure that I take good care of that. When have we done that with people? Like really guard them, protect them take care of them, make sure that, that nothing happens to them. Man, God, 
God is showing me, and I hope he'll show you this, this morning, that we have to start looking at people made in his image. We're made in his image. See, gossip, it's tearing people apart. It's tearing apart the dignity of God. Maybe you say you care for justice. Then answer me this. How do you treat God's masterpiece? Because that's justice. That's God's heart for justice. It's people. It's all people. And maybe if we would value others, they'd start to value themselves. It's crazy because I, I did this illustration in youth, like I said, like three weeks ago. And literally, even last week, I have students coming up to me and like, Pastor Brooke, is the phone okay? <laughs> Can you please just tell me? And I just won't tell them because I just don't want to. <laughs> They're like, Can you, is it a real phone? <laughs> like, please. Can I have it? <laughs> Literally, still asking me. And multiple people. And I'm like, oh, I, I wish we cared for people that way, right? You heard about someone, like someone gossiped to you about someone else. Like, I, I wonder if we would be the type of church I'd be like, oh, my gosh. Like, is, is Brittany okay? Like, did you hear, did you hear, like, like or we'll go to that part. Are, are you okay? Like, I'm just, I'm just still wondering. Like, it can't leave my mind if you're, if you're actually doing okay or not. Like, this is the church that, that God called us to be a part of. See, it's time we, we knock down barriers of bias so we could recognize the true value of people because barriers block us from recognizing. When the Imago Day is forgotten, man, our communities, our nations, our world, it falls apart. When we forget about the image of God, what would change in your life if you viewed all people made in his image? Because when you view all people made in his image, you can't help but address poverty. You can't help but address sex trafficking. Like, you can't help but address homelessness. You can't help but to, to start a Ruth Center and, and address the, the seniors who are neglected in other countries. You can't help it. When we get this principle right, then we do get justice right. Like, we have to get to the root of the things. See, justice without Jesus, guys, is just not real justice. And Jesus is, it's called us to love all people. Regardless of one standing with the Lord, we are purposely created by God and we bear his image. And maybe we should start to seek to recognize before we so quickly reject. A fun fact about me is in college when, I, I think I was like a sophomore in college, I, I love to play sports. And so one of my friends was like, Brooke, come to rugby practice with me. I was like, rugby? And so I, so I went and I played rugby with her. It was a bunch of fun. And I thought I was just going to practice, but then the coach was there and the coach was like, you're really good at tracking. I'm like, I don't even know what that means, but okay. <laughs> and then he was kind of explaining to me, and he's like, hey, I want you, I want you to, come, to come play rugby for us because you have this really great talent. The thing is, is he recognized something I didn't recognize. I had the talent, I just didn't see it, but when he called it out, what was I able to do? I was able to use it. I was able to recognize it. It's not that anything really changed except for someone else recognizing something in me that I had there all along. Hallelujah. Maybe if we recognize the image of God in others, they would start to recognize it in themselves. Maybe if we would point out things like, oh, you're made in the image of God. They'd be like, wow, I, I never knew that. See, barriers, they block us from recognizing, but when we let God break the barriers in us, the movement of the gospel could go through us. The gospel's for all people. Do you recognize the need for all people? Who are you trying to reach? Who do you believe the gospel is really for? Because he didn't bring salvation for, for one race, one creed, one political party. And sometimes in church, I think we're really good at saying things like, you know, despite any of your sin, it doesn't matter how bad you blew it, you are welcome in the kingdom of God. Well, what about how they voted? Then are they welcome in the kingdom of God? See, I think we're good at, at sometimes bringing up things like, there's no shame. But then we treat people completely different based off an opinion they have or, or some way that they, they lean towards. And it, it's killing us. This doesn't tolerate, I, I need you to hear me, this doesn't tolerate injustice. This just gets us to see things differently. To see things the way Jesus saw things. When Jesus was put on a cross for us, you know what he said to his enemy? He said, forgive them, Father, for they do not know. What was that? That wasn't Jesus saying, hey, like, I'm totally okay with what you're doing. He's saying, they just don't recognize it. I'm dying for them too. I love them too. 
And they, they don't know. So forgive them, Father, because they have yet to recognize. See, despite your background and your sin and your success and your failures, your ethnicity, when you come to the cross of Christ, you're made new. You're made new. And Peter proclaimed the gospel on this day because what? He recognized the truth of an impartial God. And he comes into this house and he declares this truth of a God who loves everyone. And later you would have Paul who would celebrate the same truth. And he would declare in Galatians 3, there's no Jew or Greek or slave or free. There's no male or female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. See, barriers, they, they block us from recognizing. But the second thing barriers do is they block us from receiving. In verse 44, it says, Peter was still speaking these words, and the Holy Spirit came on all who heard. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles. He's speaking, and all of a sudden, the Gentiles are receiving the Holy Spirit. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God, and then Peter said, Surely no one could stand in the way of them being baptized, because they have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. Just as we have. See, we notice that Cornelius was a God-fearing man, but he still needed Jesus. He still needed Peter. He still needed him to come because it doesn't matter how sincere your heart is. The reality is, is he needed the truth of the whole gospel revealed to him. He needed to get to Jesus. This is why it matters. It's not just like, oh, well, they have a good heart. No, we need Jesus because there's only one name that saves, and that's the name of Jesus. And when Peter goes and he proclaims this truth, what astonishes them is not that the Holy Spirit came, but the Holy Spirit came in the same way that it came to the Jews. It's like, wait, he doesn't, he doesn't have any favoritism. He really does care about all people. What barriers have stood in your way from others receiving Jesus? It's a real question I want us to evaluate. I have these cones that kind of represent different barriers that we put in our way of others receiving Jesus, right? Maybe these are barriers that stand in our way from us receiving, or maybe we put up barriers where others can't receive, right? You put down a barrier because you find out someone is pro-life, and you're like, nah, like I... Uh, and, and it drops. Just, it's just like a little barrier there. And then we have a different barrier that comes around, and you're like, oh, well... I don't like who you voted for, you voted for, for Biden, that really bothers me. And, and this made me really bitter, what you said to me the other day. And, and, a, and, a, and a cone kind of drops down in our heart. We have our own personal insecurities, right? And, and that comes about, this is one I've seen a lot lately, what someone posts on social media, or maybe what you post on social media, right? And you're like, I, I don't agree with that. And so something gets posted, Boom, a barrier set. And then all of a sudden, we're, we're hurt by other people, a barrier set. You're like, oh, a woman's preaching today? Barrier set. <laughs> right? You're like. <laughs> Gossip. This is a huge one, guys. Someone gossips, a barrier set. Right? Some of them are little, right? It's like, oh, they're an FSU fan? Shoot. Barrier set, right? <laughs> you have other ones? Well, they might not be pro-life, but they're pro-choice, and I, I just don't agree with that, so barrier set. And, or they might not be Biden, but they like Trump, so barrier set. Now, what's happened? It prevents you from moving because you get to a point, you're like, oh, can't go there. Oh, I can't go there, and you're, and you're walking. You're like, and then all of a sudden, you're stuck. Let me bring this into a more practical light. This month alone, I've seen multiple posts going around on, on both sides, and the post goes something like this. Here's my story. Here's why this, this, this choice bothers me with the pro-life, pro-choice, for instance. This is why this bothers me. And they'll post something of why it bothers me, and then they'll say this. So if you were on the other side, F you. <laughs> and they have the middle finger emoji up. I'm not exaggerating when I could tell you at least five people I've seen post things like this. And what hurts me about that is I'm reading it and I'm like, oh man, I get it, like I get your side. But then you just, you put up a barrier. Why, why are you flicking me off? Like why, like why are you getting so angry? And, and we post things not realizing it's just putting up more barriers. Sometimes people ask me, Pastor Brooke, why aren't you more active on, on Instagram? Because I really do believe God has a message he wants to share. And it's my heart that I don't put up any barriers that's going to stop anyone from hearing the message of Jesus. 
It's, it's not, and it's hard because people will say, well, if you're silent, then you don't really care. And it's like, no, 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 I do care. I care so much. I need everyone to hear one message that's above every message, and that's the name of Jesus. And if I could get this person to listen on this side and this person to listen on that side, I'm going to do whatever I can, and I'm going to think more about the brothers and sisters that are, are hurt. I mean, there's two sides, and, and guys, like, why? Because they're made in the image of God. This is God's creation. And the enemy is tricking us. The enemy is killing us. Right? Sometimes he doesn't have to work at destroying our purposes because we destroy each other's purposes. And we've done such a good job at, at hurting each other and going against each other. And please don't sit here and feel condemned because I'm speaking from choices I've made, from things that I have done, and from where God has spoken to me about valuing his people. You know, when you set up barriers, what you're doing is you're saying you have to behave before you believe. And here at Greenhouse, we really do believe that we want people to believe before they ever behave. And yet we treat people the other way all the time. When a barrier goes up, that's us saying, well, you didn't agree, you didn't believe in what I believed with, <laughs> or you didn't behave this certain way. And I just want us to really inspect our heart and ask, what barriers am I putting up? See, the Holy Spirit, I hope that today, this morning, he'll start to change hearts. This sermon, it's not just to bury biases, but it's to really break through them because barriers are blocking us from receiving. And, and we see this, Jesus saw this firsthand. Jesus experienced barriers that were blocking him. Jesus, he goes to his hometown in, in Mark chapter 6 and says, Jesus was in his hometowns and, and he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard Jesus were amazed. Jesus comes and he starts teaching and people are amazed at his teachings but then barriers start coming in. They're like, wow, who is this guy? They're trying to figure out who it is. And in verse 3, it goes, wait, isn't this the carpenter? <laughs> Bias. <laughs> isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And the Bible says, and then they took a fence with him. What's a barrier? It's a fence that we build, that blocks the gospel from moving, that prevents movement. And Jesus says to them in verse 4, only in his hometown, among his relatives, in his own house as a prophet without honor. And this is such a sad verse. And he couldn't do any miracles there. Their barriers stopped them from receiving. I wonder who was supposed to receive a miracle that day. I wonder how many of us are supposed to receive miracles and God's wanting to do something and he's, he's showing up full of power, ready to help us, but we've put up barriers and it has blocked us from being able to receive. I wonder how many conversations that you've had with someone and, and they're supposed to speak something to you, but you have barriers of judgment in your heart towards them. You have, you have seeds of bitterness towards that person. And it's like when they speak, you don't, you don't listen to it, right? Or we get barriers of, of things where, where we get used to certain people, right? I'm sure parents experience this firsthand, like uh, someone tells them something that a parent's been telling them a thousand times before, and they're like, seriously? <laughs> like, I've been telling you that my whole life. <laughs> and they put up barriers. See, barriers, they stop us from receiving. Who's trying to talk to you, but maybe you haven't been able to, right? This is why... Gossip has to stop. Amen. This is why what we post really does matter. Now, this isn't a legalistic thing. It has to start with our heart. And it kills me because I recognize that barriers are blocking us. It's blocking the gospel from moving. Another way to put it is barriers stop us from being carriers. <laughs> There's a rhyme you can make. If you, if you have this barrier, it's, it's going to stop you from being able to do everything God wants you to do. It prevents us from revealing God's true character. <laughs> What if we would fight more for people than we did for policies? Like, what if we cared more for the Imago Dei? See, in God, he uses the power of his spirit through people. So what am I supposed to do about this? The application for today is you best recognize. 
you best recognize. Repent of bias. This is what, I'm just telling you to do what Peter did. In verse 34, it says, Peter begins to speak. He's in a house full of Gentiles, and he repents in front of all of them. I now realize how true it is that God doesn't show favoritism, but he accepts from every nation. See, Peter, in that moment, it didn't matter. He was saying, I was wrong. I was wrong. I realized that God loves all people. This week, ask God to search you. Seek him. See God's heart on certain things. Recognize what God is speaking to you and saying to you. Recognize the bitterness in your heart or the bias in your heart or, or the anger in your heart. And let God do something in you. This takes humility. I get it. But if, if we want to be people who go to the ends of the earth, we have to be willing to go to the end of ourself and say, God, I, 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 need, I surrender everything. I realize I could be biased, so biased, I don't even know what it is. So God, reveal it to me. If you're familiar with the story of Gandhi at all, uh, Gandhi actually, um, he had seriously considered being a Christian before. This, this guy was given a Bible by a believer, and, and he, he, was, he decided, you know, I'm going to read through this Bible because I told him I would. And so it says that he actually read through, like, the Old Testament, and he didn't really get it. He was like, oh. But he felt like he had to continue reading it because he told his friend that he would. And he gets the Sermon of the Mount. And he talks about the Sermon of the Mount. And he's like, this sermon, this is it. This could be the answer to the caste system. This is what Gandhi thinks. Like this, man, this, this Jesus was actually really on to something. And so Gandhi wants to go to a church service. And when, when he goes to a service, he says this. He says he walks in. And one of the ushers comes up to him. And he was turned away by segregation that was practiced in the church and said these words, I suggest you find somewhere else to worship. It was due to this experience that Gandhi later declared a quote you might have heard, I'd be a Christian if it weren't for Christians. Because I like your Christ, but I don't like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. I want us to be just like Jesus. It doesn't mean we're going to be perfect, but I want us to live out this image of God because Acts 10, what's so great about the story is, is Christianity was the first religion to disregard racial and cultural and national limitations. In Acts 10, you have the outpouring of the Spirit on the Gentiles, and you have the first multi-ethnic church that is born right here. So let's break any barrier that's stopping us or others from receiving. On our own, we cannot do this, and this is why the good news is, and this is the last thing we're going to talk about, is Jesus' blood will break every single barrier. Jesus' blood will break every single barrier. See, in the garden, in the beginning, before there was sin, there was no barrier between man and God. We had, there was full access to him. But the problem is that sin came in. Disobedience happened in the garden, and sin came in. God wasn't, wasn't telling Adam and Eve to, to not disobey because he wanted to be some God that was going to point his finger at them and be mad at him. He was telling them because he knew the consequence of sin was death, was a spiritual death. And God wanted so badly to be with his people that when sin happened, and it says Adam and Eve ran away, but God pursued them still. It was like, I, I have to find a way to get us back together again. But because God is perfect, he is holy, he is without sin, he could not be with sin, so the only thing he could do is come down himself. Because he's the only perfect one. He's the only sinless one. And he had to make a sacrifice to die for our sins. So it was an atonement sacrifice that he would make. And God himself would come and he'd be called Jesus and he'd live on this earth a, a perfect life with no sin, with a purpose, a God-given purpose to die so that we could live, a purpose that sent him to a cross where he would hang on a cross and it says the wrath of God was finally satisfied because it was, be, it was able to be poured on him. It was able to be poured on, on, on him who was perfect and he absorbed 
the wrath of God. He absorbed our sin and our shame and everything on the cross. This is why Jesus could look at a man and say, forgive them, Father, because they do not know because Jesus had a bigger picture in mind. And it seemed like a bad story when you start reading it until so you recognize because he was without sin, death could actually not contain this man. The grave had no claim over him. And he rises from the dead three days later. He rises from this grave three days later for our sin. And now we could all get to Jesus. We could all get to God through Jesus. This is great news. What happened in that moment was there was a, a veil that was torn. In Matthew 27, it talks about that. It says, at the moment, this is when Jesus is on the cross, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. And when the centurion and those with him were guarding, it's interesting that it's a centurion. That really stuck out to me. Like, this is an interesting thought. I wonder if this guy went and told other people. But it says, when those with him saw this earthquake, they were terrified and they exclaimed, Surely he was the son of God. See, the, the veil was this, this physical, visible barrier that would actually, it, it, it was there and it was an indication that strictly prohibited us to be able to go to a holy God because we were unholy. We weren't able to enter into the holy of holies because we were not holy. But when this veil was torn, it was because we now had access to Jesus or to God through Jesus. This is where I'll end it. Ephesians 2. It says, therefore, remember. And this ties everything together. Remember that formerly you were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Verse 14, for he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one. And what has he done? He has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside his flesh and the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross. See, Christ, he, he broke the barrier between God and between people. And it's like I've been saying, when we let God break barriers in us, the movement of the gospel could go through us, but some of us need to let God break barriers in us so the gospel could come to us so that we could recognize, man, like, man God, there's, there's no sin that you cannot cover. There's nothing that you cannot do. We need him to break barriers of shame or of hate or of discord. But it's like I've been saying, we have to let him. It's our choice. If we choose him, he will choose to dwell in us. And the cross is the bridge that takes us from barriers to blessings. We hope the Lord spoke to you through this message. Thanks so much for listening. If you've enjoyed this sermon, be sure to click that like button. It helps others to find our videos. You can also post a comment about your favorite part of the message. Another way to connect is by subscribing to our YouTube channel. I hope your week is wonderful. Live green.